Give them a little wave. Ten people. Come on, ten people. Make it awkward. Say, I see you. Say, it looks like you lost some weight in these last seven months. Come on, you look great. You smell great. <laughs> Amen. 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 Hey, do you like who you're sitting next to? That was a trick question. Most of you aren't sitting next to nobody. Well, hey, praise God for a massive auditorium where, you know, before uh, empty auditoriums used to like, they were like the death of me. They were like my worst nightmare. But now it just feels safe, right? Except these demonic speakers. It just feels safe. It feels like, hey, I can't get COVID going to church, right? Amen. Well, hey, just one more time again. If it's your first time, welcome. Go, can we give it up for all our first time guests, everyone that is new to Oceanside? Uh, since usually this will be the time where I tell you to take out your connect card and fill it out and put it in a bucket. We're not doing any of that. We're actually going to cut that off our service. But what you can do is you can actually go to oceansidechurch.com forward slash connect. And right there you're going to find a virtual connect card. And here's why that virtual connect card is so, so, so critical. Tomorrow morning my wife and I and really our whole team, we're going to send you an email thanking you for coming to Oceanside Church. And if today you feel inspired, you feel like God is calling you to make this your home, church, or God is doing something inside of you, we're going to give you some next steps on your faith journey. Because I don't know if you know this about our God, but he always has a next step for you. Amen? But also, these connect cards are so, so critical because, um, honestly, if I had to pastor you and I got to show up to your house, and let's say you can't text me your address, guess where I go? I go to the database. Um, when I, I, when I want to wish you a happy birthday, guess where I go? To the database, you know? where I want to tell you happy anniversary and send you a dinner on us gift card. Guess where I go look? Come on, are y'all going to go fill out that connect card right now, right? Amen. Well, hey, I'm so excited that you are here today. I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled that we have an opportunity to gather. And I have a word of my heart, and I hope you came ready to receive. Did you? Three of you. Five of you. Come on, six of you. Fifteen of you. Golf claps. Come on, praise God. And if you've got a Bible, you can turn with me to uh, one little, 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 little verse found in Acts chapter 20. And by the way, I'm, I'm really excited about today because immediately after service, can we have a class participation? Can you say today? Right after service, we are getting ready to have a welcome to church party, somebody. And some of you are like, I don't even know what that is. A welcome to church party is what we used to formally call the growth track. Really what the growth track is, is it's a two-part gathering that we do every single Sunday, and it is intended to help you discover more about who our God is, who our church is, and really, more importantly, it's our greatest desire to help you discover what your God-given purpose is. I don't know if you know this, but go like this to your chest and say, I have a purpose, and I want to help you discover that. So right after church, you're going to see somebody with a sign that literally says, discover purpose, and you can follow them. We're going to have pizza. There's child care. Care, not clear. Care. And it's a welcome to church party. Amen. Because somebody, come on, you ought to just get excited in here for a little bit. But Acts chapter 20. Today we are starting a brand new collection. I know it's a lot of information. Like, Pastor, slow down. We should put this in a video. I'll put it in a video next week. But Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 35, it's just a few little words. And this is the Apostle Paul echoing the words of Jesus Christ himself. And he says this. You ready for it? I'm going to read it on the screens with you. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I grew up in old school church. Anybody grew up in old school church like me? Three of you. Five of you. Come on. In old school church, they used to make people read the verses out loud. So we're going to go back to old school church because there's just a lot of social distancing. I want to make sure you're in the room. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to read this entire verse with me. Can you do that? One, two, three. It is more to give than to receive. Today, we're starting a brand new collection. It's entitled Blessings on Blessings. Come on, anyone want some blessings on top of blessings? Just give me a little wave if that's you. I know we've just come back from a year that feels like it's been cursed, but we serve the God of the blessing. Blessing upon blessing. And uh, really, when we're talking about blessing, I just got to title this message, and it's going to be a few weeks. And by the way, we're not asking you for anything. Please, you don't see any buckets. You don't see anything. Our church is so generous. You give. You've been giving through a pandemic. We've been able to get into a, our own office uh, recording studio space because of your giving. It's called Oceanside Central. God has been so faithful the last seven months. Well, we give God some praise for that. We have a generous church. You give a lot online, and I love that. So that's why we don't have to pass the buckets. But just a little disclaimer, we're not asking you for anything. But actually, as a matter of fact, right after service, we have something for you. Come on, anyone like free stuff? You didn't know you were going to get free stuff at church today, right? But you see, 
as we were getting ready to start this brand new collection of talks entitled Blessings on Blessings, I was talking to one of the overseers of our church about it, and he told me, uh, Bennett, I want to give every single family at your church a book. So literally, Generation in Church in Miami bought every single family at Oceanside Church a book. Come on, somebody. Praise God for that. And they said, I hope that you run out because after they run out, we're going to buy you some more books. So right after service, on your way out, you can see our incredible guest relations team, and they're going to have a free book for you entitled The Blessed Life. Come on, somebody. That's, that feels good, right? Right after a pandemic, I'll take a blessed life. But today I want to preach to you a simple message entitled, you ready for it? You ain't ready for it. Wait till I get my money right. Come on, somebody. We're talking about blessed life. We got to go there, right? As a matter of fact, let me give it a better title. Nah, 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 nah. Wait till I get my money right. If you don't know, you better ask somebody, you know? But can we pray and ask the Holy Spirit to talk, to speak to us today? Is that okay? Father God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. And God, right now we open up our hearts, our minds, our ears. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak to us. Lord, we refuse to leave these gatherings the same. God, we thank you that you have been so faithful, Lord, through these last seven months to not only Oceanside as an organization, but Oceanside as a church body. God, you have provided all of our needs and that forever we are grateful, Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that your promises, God, there are yes and amen. God, so some twisted preacher can get up to a platform and say that you're not something, God, but you are. You are the God of the blessing. You are the God that is able to surpass all of our understanding, God. You are the God that gives exceedingly abundantly more than we ask, think, or imagine. So while we're at it, Holy Spirit, if that is who you said we are, we pray for the Miami Dolphins. We actually take a moment of silence because we're grieving how bad they are, God. Lord, may you do a work in the, the hands of our quarterbacks, whoever one is playing. Bless coach. God, we want to see wins in Miami. And all of God's people said, come on, and all of God's people at Oceanside Church said, Amen, 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 amen. Well, how about the heat? That was close, right? Y'all didn't pray enough. Y'all didn't pray enough. It's because our church is like full of like, we got some Canadians at our church that every time the heat play, they're like cursing the heat. We got some people that like LeBron and like, yo, you know, you've been to California, bro. Why do you like the heat, you know? And we got a lot of like heat haters at our church. So I think that was the, the issue why the heat didn't win. But uh, there's always year two, amen? And, um, but hey, nevertheless, um, Anyone, maybe throughout these last seven months, had found yourself, yourself questioning people's intentions? Anyone? No? Just me? I don't know, parents. Um, I, have a, I have two beautiful little boys, River. I should say, maybe not beautiful, but handsome. Come on, it's a little more. You know. Two little handsome little guys, um, River, who is two, and Maverick, that is 11 months. I, I lost track, you know? His birthday is next month. And uh, they are my pride and joy, but, but River is uh, starting to get a little malicious. You know, he's starting to get a little slick, and he's starting to get a little, you know, he's getting a little wise. He's getting a little um, witty with these words, you know, and um, every single morning, I usually try to wake up before all of them, because if you know anything about having kids, you cannot work if your kids are awake, right? Come on, parents. It's like a disaster, right? It's like, bro, get out of here, you know? I'm trying to finish a message. And, um, and, and River, he'll come downstairs, and he has this new little thing. He goes, daddy, daddy, daddy. I scared. He goes, look. I'm like, scared of what? And you'd be like, the spiders. I'm like, there's no spiders in the house, bro. And, but really, what I figured out is that his intention behind daddy, I scared, look, is daddy hold me. You know, pick me up. It's daddy lay down in the couch with me. And, and he has, and, and I know that um, daddy, I scared, is going to turn into daddy, I love you. And really, the motivation and intention behind daddy, I love you, is daddy, can I get $20 so I can go to the movies with my friends? You know what I'm saying? Come on, I know because that was me. Like, you know what I'm saying? Daddy, you're the best daddy in the whole wide world. Can I have 20 bucks? You know, is that anyone here? Just checking, you know. Uh, but we often find ourselves in a really jaded world, in a world that it appears that there is so many reasons to be cynical and skeptical about what people's intentions are. We can easily find ourselves questioning intentions all the time. Anyone with me? It's like we can, we can, we can curse, you know, we can, we can uh, blame those late night commercials that say if you buy this thing, you wrap it around your waist, it guarantees you're going to have a 12 pack. Bro, I eat Cheetos all day. I'm not going to get a 12 pack, you know, with this mechanical thing. You know what I'm saying? And um, thanks a lot, late night TV. But nevertheless, so often we hear, we read things about God's word and 
So often we read things that perhaps God's word even is uh, commanding us to do. And so often, because we live in this jaded, cynical world, we find ourselves oftentimes questioning God's intentions. So often we read verses and we say, okay, God, you're asking me for this, but what's your intention behind this? Is it because you don't want me to have a, a fun life? Is it because you don't want me to enjoy this or you don't want me to enjoy that? Oh, I see the kind of God that you are. You're trying to have me, get me to have a boring life. And so often we can find ourselves questioning God's intentions. And really, let's be honest, there's been a lot of preachers that have stood in platforms like this one that have twisted God's word. And actually, there are several reasons for you to question God's intentions when it comes to what these men, these men and these women are, are preaching. But today I came to debunk a myth. And I don't know if maybe a year of perhaps chaos has warped and twisted your perspective of God, but I came to tell you a very simple thought, that God's desire, God's intention from cover to cover in his word is to bless you and to bless your children and your children's children, to bless you to a point where it is overflowing to every area of your life. And maybe you think, man, pastor, that is very elementary. But I just think some people have forgotten. In a year that it appears that it was so cursed, a year that it appears that perhaps God has shunned Humanity, no, 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 no. God's intention for his people is still to bless you. And let me just tell you one more thing because it's on my heart. Like I just told you a few minutes ago, it is a generational God. Every time God went to bless somebody, he said he blessed Jacob, Isaac, and the rest of the nation. So, so often we find ourselves, God bless me, bless me, when really he wants a blessing to overflow through you. God's intention is to bless you. All right, Pastor, that's, that's elementary. I, I knew that. But here's the catch. You see, the catch to a blessed life is often a product of a carefully positioned heart. As a matter of fact, get this into your spirit. God's good intentions oftentimes are withheld because of improperly positioned hearts. As a matter of fact, here's my thesis. Write down, just write down my thesis. It's coming up on the screens, but it's this. The path to a blessed life is found through a generous heart. Yeah. God's intention is to bless you, but the pathway to a blessed life first has to be with an aligned heart, aligned to a generous heart. You see... I know what a lot of you think. It's like, oh, man, Pastor, you're starting right off the gate from a giving message? No, 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 no. Let me show you this really peculiar verse that for years it's bothered me just, just because I've heard a lot of preachers talk about it out of context. But Luke chapter 6, verse 37, it says this. Check this out. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure Pressed down, this is, by the way, a great definition of a blessing. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be used back to you. Pastor, what's a blessing? A good measure, just, just think about this. A good measure, you know, like when you're, when you're trying to, um, you know, somebody, a buffet, and you're trying to make sure it's like all, you know what I mean? No, no or better yet. Those buffets that they don't charge you to go? They're like squeezing the rice together. Come on, come on. Let's squeeze the mashed potatoes together over here. Press down. You shake it together just to make sure it's ready. Press down, shaking together, running over. It will be poured into your lap. Now, I've heard this. I, like I said, I grew up in church. I grew up in like Pentecostal church. You know what I'm saying? Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. At this point, everybody will be up on their feet already. If I read this verse at my dad's church, you know what I'm saying? We'd have to bring out modesty blankets because, you know, y'all don't even know what I'm talking about, you know? People would have tambourines. They'll be running around church, you know, like Santo. Come on, it was a Brazilian Spanish church. You don't know anything about that. Pentecostal. But I grew up listening to this verse, and every time I heard this verse, can you guess what the topic it was revolving around was? Money. But every time I read this verse, it has nothing to do with money. As a matter of fact, the context of this verse is judging. It's like gossip. Like, hey, you need to stop gossiping. Because if you keep on gossiping, gossiping is going to come back to you. This verse has nothing to do with money. You see money anywhere in there? Come on, talk to me. It's a class participation day. You see money in there? No, but what it is, it's a kingdom principle. 
I don't know if you know this, but we do not operate based upon the kingdom values of this world, but we operate in the kingdom values of heaven. The Bible says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the result of that is that you will know God's good, God's pleasing, and God's perfect will. We do not operate in the kingdom of this world, but we operate in a heavenly kingdom. And what this is, it's a kingdom principle. And you see, this message is so critical because all week long, I was like, I don't know if I should preach about this. And yesterday, I went to Bank of America, or two days ago, I went to Bank of America. And um, I was getting a check, a cashier's check. And behind me, there was this sweet old lady that literally got in a fight with the clerk. She's like, you skipped my turn. As a matter of fact, I know what you were thinking. You weren't even going to give me all the amount of money that I was going to ask. I was like, oh, my gosh. Because after a season of taking, taking, taking away, all we want to do is keep. But the kingdom principle to a blessed life is not keep, but it's let go. And I know what you're thinking. A lot of you are tuning out because I know you probably heard money or giving being talked in church. And you're like, look at this. The church just wants my money. It's like, shoot, pastor, I brought my friend to church on a day. Were you talking about money? No, 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 no. This has nothing to do with money. Nothing to do with money. But it has everything to do with a generous heart. And let's be honest. There's a lot of preachers that have talked about God giving and money in the same combination. And the result of that was to pay for their Bentley, to pay for their private jet. But that's not my intention today. But actually, what I want to do is I want to get to the point of the matter. I believe that God's heart for us today is this. The point of this message is that giving is a cornerstone piece of the Christian life. As a matter of fact, one preacher one day, he was being interviewed, and uh, this, this reporter came up to him and said, Hey, sir, uh, how often do you talk about money at your ch- or giving at your church? And he goes, Giving? Every single Sunday. And he's like, Really? You talk about giving at your church every single Sunday? He goes, Oh, okay. I see what you're asking. You're asking me how often I talk about money at my church. He goes, because I can't really preach Jesus without talking about giving. For God so loved the world that he... I can't talk about marriage without talking about giving. Because the Bible says, husband, love your wives as Jesus loved the church and gave his life up as a ransom sacrifice. I can't talk about parenting and not talk about giving. Because the reality is, as parents, all we do is give, 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 right? Come on, somebody. I can't talk about grace without talking about giving because it is by grace you have been saved. This is not your own doing, but it is a gift of God. I can't talk about the Holy Spirit without talking about giving because God gave us his Holy Spirit. We cannot talk about the Christian life and not talk about giving the cornerstone of our life. As a matter of fact, the verb of the Bible, can you guess what it is? Give. You take John 3.16 out of the Bible, I believe it will fall apart. Because if Jesus never gave his life up for you, we would still be dead in our sins and our trespasses. And we would still be stuck in the patterns of this world. But because Jesus gave his life up freely to you today, you have access to salvation. Today you have access to a transformed life. Today you have access to a blessed life. All because of God that led the way in his generosity towards us. As a matter of fact, if you can understand this today, If you're not careful and you allow the narrative of giving to be only about money, what you will often do is run the risk of locking yourself out of God's purpose for your life. Because you will never walk in your divine design if you can't first have a revelation that whatever God has created you to do, it was created for it to flow through you. God's intention is not for you to be a reservoir. God's intention is for you to be a river. God's intention is for you to be a good farmer. A good farmer doesn't put out one seed. or And I'm not talking about money again. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your talents. I'm talking about kind words. I'm talking about a life of generosity. God's promise is not that you would have a blessed wallet, but it's that you would have a blessed life, a blessed marriage, a blessed job, a blessed attitude, a blessed heart, a blessed mind, blessed sleep. And the Bible tells us that the world of the stingy It gets smaller and smaller and smaller while the world of the generous, it just expands. 
But here's the thing I want you to know. Giving was not instituted by man, but it was instituted by God. And it wasn't for God's sake, but it was for your sake. God wasn't up in heaven saying, oh, shoot. (sighs) HPL bills, heaven, power, light. The heavenly FPL is coming in, and, man, the angels, they've been partying up all night, and they kept the light running too much. I have an idea. River or two year this is so funny. He goes, hmm, I have an idea. God is not like, hmm, I have an idea. Let's have the people give. In some way, somehow, it gets up to heaven so we can pay. No, no, no. The Bible says that God owns thousands of cattle upon the top of thousands of hills. What that means is he's got a lot of meat, and filet me on is expensive. You know what I'm saying? The Bible tells us that God uses gold so that people can walk on top of it. The Bible tells us that heaven has 12 gates and they're made out of pearls. Oh, come on. The Bible tells us that in the rivers of heaven, there are crystals. Come on, don't you think that God knows where all the rubies, all the diamonds? Tiffany and Cole doesn't know where they're all at, but Jesus knows. God did not implement giving for his sake. And as a matter of fact, I stand here with a conviction in my soul that this church, God's intention Behind this entire message is not that the church will be prosperous. No, 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 no. God will bring provision to his church whether you give or whether you don't give. I am convinced that giving is not for his sake, but it's for your sake. Because here's why. Here's the verse. And by the way, I know what a lot of you are thinking. Pastor, I'm going to tune out for this one because, um, na, 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 wait till I get my money, right? And then I'll go play this on YouTube again. Nah, bro. Because here's a thought I want you to write down. Generosity isn't a matter of getting your money right. It's a matter of you getting your heart right. And by the way, now that we're on the topic of money, let me just tell you something. It's a lot easier to give with less than it is to give when you have more. Like we're getting ready to start in a few years giving River an allowance just so he can learn how to give. Because if he can learn how to give with $20 a month, In Jesus' name, he's going to be an NFL player. He's going to learn how to give with $20 million. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm saying? I'm just getting prophetic up here. But here's why. The Bible says like this. Here's why giving is for your sake and not God's sake. Jesus said it like this in the book of Matthew. Chapter 6, verse 21. He says this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Notice how it doesn't say, um, where your heart is, your treasure will follow. No, it doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, the things that you value, they dictate where your heart goes. See, my intention today was to um, have a little remote control car, and I was going to make a big heart right here, and I was going to tie a string to it, and I was going to have some random person dictate where it goes. Like I, you, you, get, you get the illustration. I mean, anyone ever invested in a stock before? A few of you. Um, you probably never cared about that stock before. <laughs> I had a cousin, right? He was sleeping over my house a few years ago, and uh, somebody told him that a stock had dropped, and that dude would wake up every single morning at 4 a.m. to check that stock. Because where your treasure goes, your heart follows. You see, so many of you, let's be honest, your marriage is on the rock because you stopped being generous and investing in your marriage after you finished paying for that reception that was really expensive. Uh, husband, do you want to fall in love with your wife again? Buy her something really expensive. And all the wives said, <clears throat> women, you want to fall in love with your husbands again? I'm just kidding. That might not apply that way, you know. <laughs> Especially if you're a stay-at-home mom, mom let's not talk about that, right? I'll, you know. But where your treasure goes, your heart follows. And here's what God's intention is. It's not to bless your wallet, but it's to bless your life. As a matter of fact, God's intention is that you would have a transformed life. But here's a formula I want you to get down. It's coming up on the screens. This is the formula to a changed life. Where your treasure goes, your heart follows. Let's be honest. When God gets a hold of your heart, he's going to get a hold of your habits. And let's be honest, the things that are destructing your life right now, if you can be honest with me and you can be honest with yourself, it is habits. Perhaps it's habits that have been passed down from from your grandparents, habits of gossip, habits of insecurity, habits of pornography, habits of 
of infidelity, habits of covetousness, habits, 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 habits. As a matter of fact, you have uphill hopes, but a lot of us, we have downhill habits. But if God can grab a hold of your heart, the Bible says that he will transform your life. He will make you into a new creation. The old will be gone and the new will come about. Therefore, he will transform your habits. And let's be honest, if God transforms your habits, you are going to have a transformed life. Your thinking is going to change. Your talking is going to change. Your walking is going to change. If God can get a hold of your heart, he will change your habits through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life every single day. And come on, if he can grab a hold of your habits. But where does it start? With what you care about the most. Where your treasure is, your heart. And here's the thing. The church doesn't just want your money. But it's the fact that God really wants your heart. As a matter of fact, our church exists to see changed lives. Our church exists so that lives, and I wish I could name names, but There's a gentleman at our church that if you ever sat down across the coffee table with him and you asked him his story, he would tell you that he was perhaps the most infamous drug dealer in the nightclub scene in Miami in Fort Lauderdale. So much so that prison prison is in his story. But today, if you see him, he's married. He's blessed. God has blessed him with a business. He's got a beautiful wife, a beautiful family. The desire of our church is that changed lives will be the result of people in our city. But there's just a formula I can't get rid of. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if God can grab your heart, he will grab your habits. And if he can grab your habits, oh, what he can do to your life. Come on, are you thankful that we serve the life-changing God? And he can take brokenness, he can take ashes, and he can bring beauty out of what appears to be dead. The God we serve, he is a life-transforming God, and his intention is to bless your life, not your wallet. So what's the goal today? Can we develop a heart that is receptive to a blessed life, and that is a heart of generosity. So really quick, I'm going to give you four points, and then we're going to sing, and we're going to pray for you, and I believe God's going to do something beautiful in here today. Amen. First thing you got to do if you're going to develop a generous heart, you got to, one, deal with a selfish heart. Look what the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy. There is this really interesting passage of Scripture that I was reading across this week that uh, it, it illustrates this so well. Verse 7 says this, If anyone among you, if anyone among you, I'm going to read it to the screens with you, if anyone among you, one of your brothers should become poor in any of our towns within your land that the Lord your God has, say that word, giving, given, it's given, not giving, that the Lord has given you, by the way, everything you have is not yours, just keep that in the back of your mind, given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his needs, whatever it may be. Verse 8 says, verse 9 says this, Take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart and you say the seventh year, the year of release is near and your eyes look begrudgingly on your poor brother and you give him nothing and he cries to the Lord against you and you become guilty of sin. Here's the context. This is a verse that was written to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel had just came out of captivity and God had given them the promised land. It was flowing with milk and with honey. It was incredible. But the Bible says... Um, make sure that you don't have a selfish heart when it's close to the year of Jubilee. See, the year of Jubilee is really cool. We should, we should bring this back. The Jubilee, year of Jubilee happened every seventh year. And what that means is that it was the year of release. What that meant is that every single debt that you had accumulated over the last six years, in the seventh year, whoever you owned, owed the debt to, they had to release the debt. Come on, anyone think that Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Capital One, student loans should implement this year of Jubilee? Come on, somebody, let's give God some praise. For the... But the year of Jubilee. So he's saying, hey, you, 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 um, Jimmy went broke. I don't know if you heard, lost his business, blah, 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 blah. Um, And you keep on telling yourself that, you know, he's asking you for money, but the year of Jubilee is coming up, and you know he's a bit stingy, and he's probably not going to pay you back, and so you hold on because you know, you know. Or perhaps, let's make it more applicable. 
You, you drive past the same homeless guy every single Sunday or every single Monday, and you tell yourself, nah, bro, I'm not going to give him a dollar. I know what he's going to do. He's going to buy cigarettes and booze. No, 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 no. He's not going to pay me back. He has no good intentions. And you get a hardened heart, and you close your hand. Jesus is saying, you got to deal with that. Because here is the thing. It is not about what they do with the money, but it's about your obedience towards God's urgence in your heart to give. As a matter of fact, If you're anything like me, the majority of your prayers are, God, will you bless me? Oh, God, hmm, the housing market is so expensive in Boca. God, why did you call us to start a church in Boca? Hmm, God, come on, God, can you give me, Lord, a discount on the house, on the ocean over there? You know, like over there, uh, it's a couple, Lord, can you just put you, can you just, Lord, can you just tug on the heart of a millionaire to give? I'm just being real. When God's intention is that your heart and God's heart for you is that every morning you would wake up and say, God, make me a blessing. God, you have blessed me with exceedingly abundantly more than I can ask, think, or imagine. According to your power at work in my life, I might not have a a lot, but I am blessed. I have more than enough. Can you make me a blessing? Can you rid me of the selfish heart? (laughs) Because let's be honest, the problem with humanity is that we have a gravitational pull towards self. We have a gravitational pull towards selfishness. But God is so faithful. God is so smart. He is so good that he created a system to break the back of greed. And that system is generosity. And let me just tell you something. Last night I was thinking, I was praying for you, and God just laid this little thought in my heart. Generosity is not a business deal between you and God. Generosity is a heart procedure that every human soul needs to go through. Think about this. Generosity for a lot of people is, God, I'm going to give. I'm going to give my time. I'm going to give my talents. And what I'm expecting back is money, rest. I want my kids to behave all because I gave. I thought I already gave you enough. But every time you give of your time, your talents, your treasures, whatever you give, what you are saying is greed has no place in my heart. Because here's the thing. Generosity will always break the back of selfishness. As I get ready to go to point number two, I just got to warn you ladies, there is one thing that men will never be generous about, and that's their food. Stop trying. Bro, it's so annoying. You know, we love Chick-fil-A, and every now and then we'll go up to Chick-fil-A, and and I I know what I want. You know what I mean? I I know what I want. I I just want that regular sandwich, and I want all those fries, and a chocolate milkshake. It's small. Put the cherry on top. It's healthy. Fruits. And Diana usually, you know, she's ordering, and um, um, I'm like, babe, I want fries. How many fries do you want, ma'am? Just one. Oh, we're sharing. No, we're not sharing. Get your own fries, and I want the ones that fall in the bag as well. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're just not going to be generous with our fries. Get your own fries, you know? Point number two. I don't know. I just had a rant. You got to deal with a grieving heart. Wait, what? Yeah, look what the Bible says in verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 10. You shall give to him freely, generously. Your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him, because for the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertaking. Um, here's what this means. Selfishness attacks you before you give. Grief, grief attacks you after you give. You ever gave something and regretted it after? I swear this happened to Diane and I this week. We gave somebody something like, babe, why did we do that? That's a lot of money. Isn't that true? Tell the true story. I was like, what were we thinking? (laughs) And I'm preaching this message today. You know, it's for me. Um, I just had a random thought. I'm sorry. Sometimes this happens to preachers. I haven't preached in front of people in a long time. I'm a little rusty. But I just remember I'm supposed to go out to dinner or to lunch after church today to celebrate someone's birthday. And I forgot my wallet. No, no card, no get. It's a rant. Why am I telling you this? Oh. Bro, come on, give it up for Sam. He's due to our church. Thank you, brother. $100. Come on, babe. We're good. We're good. We're good. Come on. I'm paying for everybody today. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> that was scripted. <laughs> why do you think Sam had, didn't have a problem giving me $100? You want to know why? Because I gave it to him before church. It's mine. Are you grieving? Are you fine? Are you chilling like you made a good decision? Here's a thought. You want to stop grieving after every time you give? Just remember where the money came from in the first place. Nah, Pastor, I'll work for it. Who blessed you? Oh, no, 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 no. 
I'm self-made. Oh yeah, you're self-made? What about the air in your lungs that you're going to have tomorrow morning to go to work? What about those fingers you used to type? What about those feet you used to walk? Come on, every good and perfect gift comes from above from your Father who are in heaven. Why does he not have a problem? Because it wasn't his in the first place. If you get this revelation that everything you have wasn't yours in the first place, you're like, I'm not gonna get. I actually borrowed this from somebody. So I'm not, I was gonna do it if it was my. I forgot my wallet. It's not yours. It's, and by the way, there's a little concept called the tithe. We'll talk about it throughout this week, this month. And I promise it's not gonna be pressing. It's gonna be for your sake, not for the sake of the church or for the sake of God. The tithe, the first tenth. The Bible says this: return your tithe, or the tithe. It doesn't say give the tithe. It says return the tithe because the 100% that you have in your bank account, it came from God. And I'm going to show you how Jesus said it, but we'll get to that in a sec. But you've got to deal with the grieving heart. Because here's the thing. You will never have a problem giving to God when you realize that what you have is his in the first place. And let me just tell you something. The devil, the enemy of your soul, will never tell you to give. If you know anything about Satan, is that he never gives. All he does is takes. As a matter of fact, he will ask for a little bit, and before you know it, you're going to give him everything. Point number three, as I get ready to close, you got to deal with the selfish heart, deal with the grieving heart. Don't feel bad about it. It wasn't yours in the first place. And third, you got to develop a generous heart. The Bible says in verse 14, you shall flourish, you shall furnish him liberally, generously, out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your wine press. As the Lord your God has blessed you, so shall you give to him. Here's something you can write down. We are born selfish, but here's a good church word, but we are born again generous. We are born selfish. Did you just cut me in line? Go ahead but we are born again generous. Um, any parents in here, you, you would know, but um, by the way, if you're new to our church, I talk a lot about my kids. It's the only illustrations I got, so just deal with it. You know what I'm saying? Um, if you're parents in here, you know that the two words you never got to teach your kids are no and mine. I cho- I, a true story. I was thinking about this this week, and that same night I was thinking about it, River was sleep talking, and guess what he was saying? No, that's mine, Bella. That's his cousin. You know kids, right? They'll be playing with a toy, and somebody, another kid will be playing with a toy over there. will be like, no, 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 no. That's mine, mine. And the person will go, all right, they go pick up another toy. No, 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 no. I want to play with that one. That one is mine. You are born selfish, but the moment you come to Jesus, what happens is you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then you go into this process of sanctification. And sanctification is simply a fancy word for looking more like Jesus. And as you are looking more like Jesus, you are born again generous. You know, sometimes River says the word mine so much, you know what I want to tell him? Bro, stop it. Grow up and start to look like your daddy. I think that's what God is trying to tell some of you. So many of you, you are so greedy. You think that the answer to the life you want is in this. It's in the keeping, but it's actually in the releasing. And what God is telling you today is be more like your daddy. For I so loved the world that I gave. Because, friend, just know this. Generosity will take you places greed can only dream of. Point number four. You want to develop a generous heart? Develop a grateful heart. Verse 15, it says this. You shall remember... You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this day. You see, it's hard to have a hard time having a generous life if you can continually remember where you've been. Sometimes I just, my testimony is a little different, and I don't, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll were not what my testimony is. My testimony is I, I, I grew up in church. Like, I grew up sleeping in the bottom of pews, you know. 
I grew up trying to pick, pick off the old gum from like 13 years ago that somebody never cleaned from the bottom. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the... But oftentimes I find myself sitting down and I, I remember those a year where my goal was to do everything in my power to run away from Jesus. I, I remember that year. Like I, I remember like lying to my mom, telling them like, mom, just I'm sleeping with my friends. That was really what I was doing is I was trying to go to a party and God knows what would have happened. And my mom like randomly showed up. She's like, the Holy Spirit told me to come. I used to hate that my mom had that like little spidey sense. But sometimes I like to sit there and just imagine how broken my life could have so easily been. But maybe some of you, it's, you can sit there and you, last month, how depressed you were, how, how addiction so overwhelmed you, how trapped you were. You see, this verse is so interesting because God is talking to the nation of Israel and he's telling them, do you remember that just a few months ago you were a slave? Let me just give you this context. Don't you remember, nation of Israel, that just a few months ago your daughters were being raped at the hands of the Egyptians? That your wives were being raped in front of you at the hands of the Egyptians? Don't you remember that you worked endlessly like a slave Due to the Egyptians? Don't you remember that yes, you had salmon in the table, yes, you had cucumbers from the nation of, of Egypt, but you were a slave. And now you got your own land. Now you got your own kingdom. Now you got your own castle. Now you have your own. And now you're trying to hold back your generosity. The answer to more is not found in keep, it's found in release. Can you just remember how good God has been to you? Tomorrow morning, can you wake up and just remind yourself of where you would have been if not for the goodness of God? Because here's something I want you to write down. No matter how much you have, you have nothing if you don't have Jesus. No matter how much you have, you have nothing if you don't have Jesus. You see, in a lot of Pastors have misinterpreted the word prosperity. The word prosperity has nothing to do with money, but it has everything to do with Jesus. At our church, we don't preach a, a give-to-get gospel. Mm -mm. We don't preach a poverty gospel. you got to give everything away and manipulate you into giving. No, no, no. We preach a generosity gospel because we have a revelation that God gave all that he was to us. Now it is our honor and our, it is our privilege to live open-handed. Come on, can I pray for you today? Is that all right? Anyone want to develop a generous heart? Anyone want to look more like Jesus this year? Anyone want to, want to have a, a life that is overflowing with blessings because it starts with a properly postured heart? If that's you, just give me a little wave. I want to know who I'm praying for today. Jesus, we come before you this morning. God, and we open up our hearts to you, God, and we ask that you would do surgery. God, we know that you have not come, Lord, to change our behavior, but you have come to transform our hearts. So I pray that right now, God, as we surrender our minds, as we surrender our hearts, I pray, God, that you would remove a heart of stone and that you would place a heart of flesh. Make us tender to your Holy Spirit to know when we ought to give, when we ought to open up our hands, when we ought to give encouragement, when we ought to give hugs, when we ought to give money, when we ought to give our time, our talents. Holy Spirit, would today you make us more like Jesus. Father, right now we remember, we forget not all of your benefits, Holy Spirit. We remember, God, how you pulled us out of a miry pit and you put us up on a rock. We remember, God, how you restored our marriages. We remember how you made us new, how you cleansed us. Holy Spirit, we remember how good you have been to us, Jesus. With every eye closed, every head bowed, just for a moment of silence, a, a moment of reflection. No one's looking. You see, you're in this place this morning and Perhaps from the moment you walked in, the Holy Spirit has been tugging on your heart. So you can be honest with yourself. You might have a lot, but if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. If you're in this place this morning, and if you say, Pastor, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to place my faith, my trust, and my belief and my confidence in Jesus. Maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time, with every eye closed, with every head bowed. If that's you today, I want to pray for you. 
I'm going to count to three, and I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if today you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you want to surrender your life to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God that desires to bless you so that he can save you, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand, put it up, put it down. I just want to know who I'm praying for. One. Friend, today's a day of salvation. You don't know what your tomorrow holds. Two. Can I just remind you? For God so loved you that he sent his one and only son to die, not just for you, but as you. Three. Today, if you want to surrender your life to Jesus for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time, just lift up your hand. I want to know who I'm praying for. Amen. I see your hands. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, church. Can we stand to our feet? And I'm going to say a prayer. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. So come on, church. Everybody, let's join them. Say today. Jesus, I surrender all that I am over to you today. I declare that you are who you say you are. I believe that you came. Come on, church. I believe you came. You died and you rose again so that I might have life. So today I place my past, my present, and my future into your hands. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, amen. Come on, if you said that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, welcome home. Come on, welcome on. We can give those people a big round of applause today. Hallelujah. What that means is that your past has been forgiven. Your present is being realigned. And your future is full of a divine hope that only comes from a Savior that loved you enough to die on a cross for you. Come on, church. we got a reason to celebrate. But come on, you want to declare a blessing over your life one more time? Come on, you want to declare a blessing over your children, over your business, over your week? Can we sing that a little bit? Come on. May his favor. May his favor. Come on, declare this over your life. Amen, amen, amen. Well, hey, can I pray a blessing over your life as we leave today? Why don't you stretch your hands towards heaven? Stretch your hands. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Jesus, thank you for bringing us here safe. Thank you that you are the God that has all of the intentions to bless us. Not just bless us, but your intention is that we would have blessings on blessings. A life of blessing. So Holy Spirit, right now I pray that you be with us in our labor and in our leisure. May you surround us with your protection and bring us back next Sunday healthy, well, and blessed. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Well, church, thank you so much for coming. We'll see you next week. We love you. Remember, get a free book outside, and we'll see you next Sunday.